we were introduced to Antiochus the fourth epiphanies last week. Now, remember that the angel gives no names and is describing this ruler from the perspective of God's eyes. And there's, you know, there are going to begin, as you see us go through the lesson today, there's more places in here where we begin to wonder whether the angel is talking about Antiochus the fourth epiphanies or perhaps a more distant ruler, perhaps an end time ruler. We're in Daniel chapter 11, beginning at verse 21. Those FFs mean and following. So we're starting at verse 21 and going through the following verses. And the angel has like a lot to say about this ruler. Last week, it was just like a little blurb, a little blip, you know, about each ruler. I and mean, we went through a couple hundred years just at a, at a clip. But when the angel gets to this ruler, the angel really pauses. The angel says the ruler will be a contemptible person. And Antiochus is, at least with respect to God and to Israel, definitely a contemptible person. He tries to make himself sound like a god by giving himself the name Epiphanes, which means the manifest, God in person. According to uh, my interpreter's dictionary of the Bible, other people nickname him Epimenes which means mad. He's definitely full of himself either way. The next bit we read about kingship not being conferred upon him is a little weird since lots of these kings come to the throne by murdering their relatives just as Antiochus did. He usurped the throne by murdering his nephew, but he was still of royal family even if he was not technically in line for the throne. And you can see that the correlation between you know, like this ruler Antiochus, the ruler in the in chapter um, 11 of Daniel and Antiochus, it just gets a little wobbly here and we have to stretch a little more to make the pieces fit, kind of like it fades in and fades out. It's, it's bizarre, you'll see. Anyway, I love Robert Alter's uh, translation of these next bits. He says, this ruler will, quote, come stealthily and grasp the kingdom through smooth talk. Now, all this presumably fits how Antiochus comes to the Seleucid throne, but we don't have a lot of historical details here. We're just, you know, making assumptions. The next few verses explain that this ruler will continue to act deceitfully and will sweep mighty forces away before him, gaining by force what he does not gain by trickery. We know from history that Antiochus's primary enemy was Egypt, the Ptolemy dynasty. The angel tells Daniel that this, quote, contemptible person will gather a large army against the king of the south. And Antiochus definitely does this, as did just about every king we've studied during this time period. Ptolemy VI of Egypt is young. He's got guardians, and his guardians lay claim to Palestine which Antiochus's father had conquered some years earlier. So it's like them there's fighting words. Rome is the real power by this time, but they refuse to intervene in a dispute over who owns Palestine. So Antiochus marches out to invade Egypt and Egypt of course musters against him. But in 169 BCE, Antiochus conquers and occupies Egypt. The angel says Egypt falls because of the plots against its, his, its king. The king of the south, he says, will be betrayed by those who eat at his table. Now, I'm wondering if this is referring to the guardians of Ptolemy the sixth. It, it's hard to tell from this distance. I'm not aware of any particular historical evidence of conspiracy or treachery such as the angel describes it, but where there are kings, there is treachery. So once again, this may or may not be talking about Antiochus and Ptolemy. The angel says the two kings sit down at table and lie to each other with malice in their hearts. Then there's a phrase that should cause all your red flags to go up. The angel says, but it will not do any good for at the appointed time, the end will come. That sounds like end time prophecy phrasing, doesn't it? 
we can almost feel the shift in focus in the angel's message. So let's keep an eye out for more flags. The angel continues. The king of the north will go back home with great wealth. Well, that fit, does fit Antiochus. He doesn't stay in Egypt long. He goes back home with his plunder. But according to the angel, his heart is set against the holy covenant and he will take action against it. This part of the prophecy seems to come out of the blue. But if this passage is referring to Antiochus, there's a backstory here that you need to know. It is during this very time that two brothers, Jason and Menelaus, fight fiercely over who will be high priest in Jerusalem. Antiochus has already been sucked into the fight, first accepting a huge payment from Jason and appointing him high priest, and then accepting an even larger payment from Menelaus and booting Jason out. It's a complete fiasco, and we'll hear all about it when we read the story of the Maccabees in the period in between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Suffice it to say, there's a lot of bloodshed in Palestine. There is infighting between Jason and Menelaus, as well as the bloodshed inherent in Antiochus and his armies matching back and forth between Syria and Egypt. There are differing versions in the Apocrypha, but 1 Maccabees says that Antiochus returns, that as Antiochus returns home from Egypt, he insolently invades the sanctuary and plunders it, speaking with great arrogance and shedding much blood and then returning to his own land. So back to Daniel. In verse 29, the angel says, at the appointed time, he will invade the south again. And sure enough, Antiochus does that in 168 BCE. But notice the, quote, appointed time phrasing. That's an end time flag. And many interpreters do not believe this section of Daniel 11 refers to Antiochus IV Epiphanes at all. I can see it either way. But, the angel says, it won't go as well this time. Ships from the west will oppose him, and he will lose heart. And sure enough, when Antiochus attacks Egypt this time, Rome shows up in force to stop him. In the eyes of Rome, it's one thing to invade Palestine, but quite another to invade Egypt. The Roman consul meets Antiochus on the beach in Alexandria and demands that he withdraw from Egypt. Antiochus says he'll think about it. The Roman consul immediately draws a circle in the sand all the way around Antiochus and says, you will give an answer before you step outside this circle or you will be at war with Rome. And Antiochus backs down. The angel says he'll turn back and vent his rage against the holy covenant again. Well, you can imagine the enraged Antiochus leaving Alexandria and marching his armies northward after being publicly humiliated. Palestine doesn't stand a chance. The book of Maccabees tells us that this attack is even worse than the last one. The angel says he will take note of those who abandon the Holy Covenant and side with him. His troops will desecrate the sanctuary, the fortress, and will abolish the daily offerings. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. This is the same abomination that causes desolation that Jesus links to the end times. This is another reason many interpreters think that despite the historical parallels, this cannot be talking about Antiochus because Jesus himself tells people to watch for this to happen in the future. Maybe this is a both and situation. I don't know. And anyone who tells you they do know definitively and without question may perhaps not have done enough homework. On this trip, though, Antiochus dedicates the temple to Zeus. He sets up an image of himself, styled as Zeus, on the altar. And according to some sources, he sacrifices a pig in the temple. Is this image of himself 
that's sitting on the altar, the abomination that causes desolation. The Jews were definitely desolated uh, during all of this. It was certainly an, um, an abomination, but why did Jesus tell his disciples to watch for this in the future? Will it happen again? After this, the angel says he will flatter those who abandoned the holy covenant, the ones he took note of earlier. We're talking about the ruler. Um, remember a couple of slides ago, he, he, he know, it says the angel said he will notice the people who abandon, who switch sides, who abandon the holy covenant and side with him. Um, but even though he flatters those who abandon the holy covenant, those who know God will stand strong and resist him. And there will then be a time of severe persecution. And we know that during the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, there is severe persecution. But the Jews fight back hard and are eventually able to defend themselves. The story in the Maccabees is an amazing one. Those who do not think this prophecy is about Antiochus read this part as being a reference to the great tribulation in the end times. And after all the detail that fits Antiochus, you might think they have no leg to stand on. But right here, it's in this very part that the angel throws in another end time sort of passage. The angel says that some of the wise will fall, so they will be purged, refined, and purified until the time of the end, for it will be for the appointed time. Now that last phrase is pretty cryptic. You can see that we have to fill in the gaps left by the Hebrew because the words are a little confusing. Some interpreters think this means the persecution has a set end time, and others read this as meaning the end time has an appointed time to happen. You can read it either way. The angel continues, the king will do whatever he pleases and will exalt himself above every other god and will speak incredible things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath that has been decreed comes to an end. Now, that's another very end time feeling sort of prophecy. And it may just mean that God has set a limit to the time Antiochus can terrorize Palestine. But it could mean end times. You could reasonably interpret this either way. There's a lot more in Daniel 11, 37 through 39 about the arrogance of this king. He honors military might and gives riches to an alien god. Well, Antiochus is strenuously Hellenistic, which means he strongly promotes the Greek culture. Hellenistic, when you hear the word Hellenistic, think Greek. He spends, an he spends just enormous resources trying to Hellenize his kingdom. So could these alien gods mentioned by the angels be the Greek gods? Maybe. Um, this ruler honors the people of this alien god and gives them vast riches and land. Well, I'm not so sure Antiochus voluntarily gave vast riches and land um, to the people of Greece unless he was doing it for his own benefit, you know, unless it was a payoff of some sort. The angel says that at the end time, there's that phrase again, the king of the south will do battle with him. And the king of the north will answer with chariots and cavalry and many ships. He will sweep through many countries like a flood, including Egypt and the beautiful land, which we know is Palestine. But Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will escape. So, None of this fits what actually happens to Antiochus IV Epiphanes. I mean, this whole Edom, Moab, Ammon stuff. The Maccabees begin their revolt in 165 BCE. And by 164 BCE, Antiochus is dead. None of this stuff happens during his reign. Whoever this king is, who sounds like, I mean, the way the the angel phrases it, it sounds like the ruler he's been talking about all the way along, but maybe not. Maybe it's another one. Whoever this king is 
will receive reports from the north and the east that alarm him, and he will march out in a great rage to destroy and slaughter many. He will pitch his palace tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. So that definitely means he camps between the Mediterranean and Mount Zion. And it makes me wonder if the reports come to him from the north and the east, is he like in the south at that moment? Was he in Egypt and then marched north? It's kind of hard to make heads or tails of this. And yet the angel says he will come to his end and none will help him. Goodbye and good riddance. The angel tells Daniel, in that time, notice the end time phrasing, Michael, the prince, who we learned last week is like, is an archangel. He's like a general in the Lord's armies. Michael, the prince who stands guard over your people, that would be Israel, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as not has not been seen ever before by any nation. So apparently from a spiritual point of view, Michael will be engaged in heavy warfare at this point. And the suffering of Israel will be beyond anything ever known. Because of this phrasing in Daniel, we have come to call this period the Great Tribulation or, quote, Jacob's time of distress, end quote, a phrase that was coined by Jeremiah back in chapter 30, verse 7 of his book. The angel says, your people, meaning Israel, he's talking to Daniel, everyone who is found written in the book will escape. Now, there's no description of what book he's talking about. Could it be a book of who the Israelites are? Is it a book of those who have remained faithful during the Great Tribulation? We don't know, because the angel does not clarify this. There will be a huge resurrection, the angel says, and some will awake to everlasting shame and some to everlasting life. Okay, so we need to talk about that. <laughs> First, notice there is no mention of a fiery hell or anything like that. What does it say? It says some awake to shame. The word here for shame also means reproach or disgrace. That word translated as everlasting is the Hebrew word alam. And it does mean perpetually or forever, although occasionally it is translated as meaning a long time. It, it does have a sense of wholeness and completeness to it, the sense of a full circle. The idea of a huge resurrection with some sort of judgment and sorting of people between everlasting shame and everlasting life is a new idea, though. In all the Bible we've studied so far, the Hebrew understanding of death has been far more low-key than this. They believed the soul went to Sheol, a neutral place of simply being dead, like a cemetery. They believed a man lived on through his descendants, which is why it was vital to have descendants and why the worst curse was for one's descendants to be wiped from the face of the earth. But here in Daniel, we've got a sort of radical idea popping up all of a sudden, and that is a red flag. You can just, just the, the chapter 11 all by itself, you can, you can see why the Hebrews, why, uh, why the Jews put, when they organized the Tanakh, their Hebrew Bible, they did not put Daniel in with the other prophets. He's not in the section called the prophets. He's in the other writings with the, with the histories and the Song of Solomon and stuff like that. So um, Daniel, Daniel is, is bringing in elements that just we don't find anywhere else. So something is going on here. And my guess is that it has to do with the Israelites being picked up and bodily moved to a completely new culture. I bet they've started to assimilate some of the cultural beliefs of the Babylonians and now the Persians. 
We'll do some digging in our breakout sessions to see what we can find. Next, the angel says that those who are wise will shine like the heavens themselves. And those who guide, quote, the many to be just or righteous will shine like the stars forever and ever. How beautiful that is. Remember how important wisdom is. This word for wise means discerning, acting wisely. Remember how wisdom danced at creation. Remember that recognizing God as God is the beginning of wisdom. Remember how wisdom is a gift we can ask for. And remember how we've run across this funny little phrase, the many, before. And how it referred to God's people, specifically Israel. And remember how justice and righteousness are the same word. Um, that one word has both meanings. There are there is another word, other word, different kinds of words used for justice as well. But this word, um, righteousness, also means justice. These these are the things to focus our attention on. These things are consistent with the bigger themes that we have seen throughout the Hebrew Bible. So I think Daniel starts taking notes pretty early on in this vision, or else the angel hands him a scroll. Because next, the angel says, Daniel, roll up and seal the scroll until the end of time. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. <laughs> and that just cracks me up. If that doesn't sound like the internet and our modern times, I don't know what does. And then the angel is joined by two more angels, one on each side of the river that Daniel's standing next to. And one of these new angels says, when will these wonders be fulfilled? And the original angel who is standing above the waters of the river says, it will be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people is shattered, then all these things will be completed. Well, if a quote time is one year, as we've suspected it to be in the prophecies thus far, then this time span of a time, times, and half a time might be one year plus two years plus a half a year three and a half years, but we don't honestly know. And notice that the power of God's people will be shattered during this time. We will suffer. These passages are meant to bring us hope and anchor to hold on to if we are caught in that time. These are meant to assure us that God is there God's hand is in this, and when the exact right time comes, God will shut down all this evil. Daniel's like, wait, 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 I don't understand. What ends up happening? But the angel says, go, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed until the end time. Many will be purified and refined, but the wicked will keep being wicked. The wise will understand, but the wicked will not. Then the angel starts giving specific time frames. I mean, he could have just stopped right there, right? And this, you know, would, but no, he starts giving like really specific time frames. He says, from the time the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,200 and 90 days. So when that abomination that causes desolation is set up and the daily sacrifice is abolished, those two things happen at the same time, a time period starts running, 1290 days. And th that's slightly over three and a half years using their 360 day year. Then he says, blessed is the one who waits and touches 1335 days. That's another very specific, bizarre number. It's the 1290 plus another 45 days. As for you, Daniel, 
Go your way until the end. You will rest and you will arise to your inheritance at the end of days. And that's the end of the book of Daniel. The angel doesn't explain anything about those time frames. He doesn't say what happens when they're done. None of the above. If you measure out from when Antiochus, the fourth epiphanies did all the things that he did and you measure forward, you know, 1290 days or 1335 days, you don't get anything. There's nothing significant. So that all seems to imply that that abomination that causes desolation was not what Antiochus Epiphanes did. Um, it, this, it's kind of the same thing with the destruction of the temple. You measure 1335 days from, or 1290 days, whichever number you pick, from 78 day, 70 um, CE, common era, when the second temple was destroyed and, and the Romans you know, did some abominable things in the temple. And, and you still don't get anything that happened at that point. So it's like this whole last section from the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes forward seems to sort of get mushy and melt and merge into the end times. And at this point, we don't have enough information to make much sense out of it. In fact, we're going to just let this sit and simmer until we get to the latter part of the New Testament. We'll come back to it then when some more information is added. In the meantime, we'll use our time in our breakout groups today to take a look at these new concepts popping up here at the end of Daniel, the concepts of an end time resurrection with some experiencing everlasting shame and others everlasting life. So first off, just tell me your reaction to all this. I think we picked up a little bit from each one of those cultures. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I was sharing that as a teacher of, you know, literature, we studied folklore those tales handed down. And I was saying that I was a little surprised, I guess, that Egypt was in there because my understanding was, and, and, and your link, it mentions that there is no Bible text, but they, they created, all mythology creates these gods and these stories of ways to explain things that we don't know how to explain, how the leopard got its spots, that kind of stuff. And I thought the same was in death. And it may say, the rich and the poor alike, but that surely isn't how the Egyptians practiced it. Only the powerful and the rich. Yeah, and 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 Egypt, Egypt and its beliefs were not monolithic at any point no. in time. No. So they they had it the evolved over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it evolved over time and different as they were subject to many civil wars, split kingdoms, and each one of the pharaohs set himself up as a god and had his own priests and priestesses and yep. his or her own priests and priestesses. And so they're, they're, it's not monolithic at all. This is just a, kind of a, a baseline from a, from a, authoritative source that was a good place to start you know it's a good a place to start as any and i tried to pick what was the belief system during the time that israel the hebrews would have been there during the time they would have been slaves mm -hmm. it got it changed and morphed over time to to be much more elaborate in egypt yeah donna had mentioned that um and um, she's, she's been typing in because she's at work. Um, but she mentioned that, you know, by the time we get to the pyramids um, in Egypt, that they had a very complex and highly evolved view of the afterlife. And, you know, those huge monuments full of elaborate grave goods and things. Right. Right. You know, um, I was reading in one of the links where it talked about, and I guess it was Egypt, where they would uh, begin construction on their grave site while they were still alive because they wanted to have it just so for when they needed it. And 
this is kind of odd to me, maybe not to the rest of y'all, but my mother has a three plot where on one end is her mother-in-law, in the middle is her husband, and on the other end was her place. And while she was alive, she posed on that tombstone and wanted me to photograph her, which just put willies through me <laughs> on every level. Mm -hmm. And those pictures never turned out. But <laughs> it made me think about that experience where she she like this is where I'm gonna be. And I was like, not for a long time, let's say. Okay. <laughs> but it seems to speak to it this being something that people this is like a, a need within people, right? Just yeah, within humanity to know where are we going. So we were talking a little bit about the um, the Persians toward the, the end of the study guide and um, that while uh, that both the, the, the evil ones go through an ordeal of molten metal to be purified, maybe everyone does, but everyone is united. Um, we were talking about um, how that might relate to um, Muslim understanding of death. For the folks in my group, we didn't go on and, and talk about it, but I looked up um, Muslims um, look forward to their death. That is a hopeful thing for them. And to you know, the Egyptians who built their tombs and knew what it was going to look like. Julia's mother knows what her tomb um, looks like. And for some in, in various cultures, death is not um, an ultimately frightening thing and possibly an ultimately hopeful thing depending on the person and depending on the culture. That's always been fascinating to me, that that belief. I, I don't have a particular belief about heaven and hell, but it's always been fascinating that people who have this deep, deep belief that when they die, they're going to be reunited with all of their relatives and it's going to be wonderful, that would take away any fear of death. That's just been fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, oh, sorry. oh, go ahead, Erica. Um, when I attended a conference about two weeks ago on grief and loss, and they highlighted that in the Western culture, we often have the talk with the young children on the sex talk and the drug and alcohol talk, but yet we never talk to our young children about death. And so they were highlighting that it is a part of, it is, you can't avoid it as part of all of our lives and what it would look like if we had a talk with our children at a young age and begin to teach them, you know, whether they, their bike was lost or a pet died or someone did something that was very difficult for them, you could kind of create um, a belief that's very different than one we have of death being so difficult and nobody really has this has been taught how to handle it until we experience it for the first time very many years later so I don't know I think similar to what Martha's saying there are there may be cultures where it is a normal conversation and it is just a part of creation and it is not to be feared like some of us have been taught because we have think of death as there's only two options. You're going to die in either. If you've been good, you go to heaven. And if you've been bad and didn't obey exactly how you needed to, you will have eternal hell. So mm -hmm. I think it, it's just a, a neat perspective that we, we, we can all grow in viewing death and loss differently. Yeah. Martha, you had something to say, I think. Yeah. Um, so I think we, we do have uh, the death talk, but we have it like like a certain kind of sex talk, which is avoid, avoid, avoid. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
what do we what do we do with kids? We teach them hold mom's hand while we cross the street. Don't run into the street. Don't cross the highway. You know, we we teach reasonably so how to avoid death. What we don't do though is talk about how rich um, a part of life it might be. And I, every time I come across a story of someone who's, well, kids experience death, death of a pet, death of a friend, death of a sibling, it's not that uncommon. Um, and I, it pains my heart when I hear a story, a real story about a family who has a terminally ill child and they don't talk with the child about the likely ultimate conclusion to their illness. And the few times that I have seen where that gets approached is when the kid pulls the parents into the truth because the kid knows. And I just, that just makes me so sad <laughs> that they don't get a chance to share. You know, Martha, um, um, I have a kid who's had a lot of near-death experiences. He's not terminal, but he, he has issues that have caused him to have frequent flyer emergency room issues. And he has the strongest faith and the least fear of death. And it's not that we've talked about it, but it's like you said, he's talked about it and he's talked about it with people at the church and he's talked about it with us. He tends not to tell me when things are happening because he worries now that he's 21, he worries that I will be upset because of how close it came. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but he's very comfortable in knowing that if, if it's his time, he's not fearful. And I don't understand that because I am fearful. I don't want to die. I cherish my life. And to be at that point, how we all approach it is different. And, and to a point Erica said about teaching children, I know my grandchildren are taught a variation of the now I lay me down to sleep prayer because they don't want it to be scary to them. So they've changed it. It seems to me that, that you know, this is sort of a generalization, I think, but in more advanced cultures where we have more and more and more technology to extend life and to avoid death, I don't know which came first, the ability to do this or our fear of death, where when you're in cultures where death is a much more common thing and people live with death. And like we were talking in our group, take gifts of food, like in, in Mexico, they take gifts of food to the, um, to the cemetery for their dead loved ones, like we read about in, in one of these, I think it was in the, the was the Canaanites, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and in, in other more ancient cultures that exist today, where people will go to the graves of their ancestors and will leave gifts and things like that. And even we leave flowers and sometimes other things at a graveside. Um, but we are much more distanced from death. We're, we're afraid of it. We don't, you know, we're think about all these stories about going through graveyards at night and all that kind of stuff. Um, the idea that we're constantly fighting to avoid death, you know, even dieting and exercise programs and staying away from certain chemicals and all the stuff that we do to avoid dying. It's so culturally ingrained in us. And perhaps that's one reason why we don't want to talk to our kids about it. Well, I, well, I also think that, that it's generational because my grandmother 
and my Grammy and her daughter, my mom, both believed that my grandmother was a firm believer that when you died, you were reunited with all your loved ones. Um, her daughter, my mom, didn't want to die because the most important person for her was my dad and she was leaving him behind. My dad and my brother's way to handle when my mom was dying was they were just going to put her on life support until they just, I don't know, until it didn't work anymore. And I had, and she had DNRs and she, she, she fought cancer for 15 years. And I'm the only one that sat down and talked to her about, mom, when the time comes, what do you want? And she told me what she wanted. And I had to almost go to court to find my dad and my brother decide with the doctors and my mom because they were so entrenched and she couldn't die because if she died, it was over. And it really brought home a lot to me that, you know what? If I have to choose between my dad, my mom, and my grandma, I'm going to stay with Grammy <laughs> <laughs> because I was not raised in a Christian household when I was growing up. I mean, my Grammy was Catholic and I'd went on special days. I was, I had no choice but to go. Um, and then as I told the group, I, I ended up in the, the Baptist cult and that was a different view on everything. It seemed like at that point, everybody was just terrified of dying because what if I didn't check a right box? Yeah. You know, and now I'm learning that, you know what? Hmm. I don't think any of that really matters because that's the little stuff and not the big picture. It's not a box. <laughs> Been, uh, I think that part of it for part of it is because um, we are of generations that have uh, grown up in the industrial age and not an agrarian society where death was a part of life as a matter of course, where you worked with growing things, where you saw death be transformed into new life. Um, the, the, and that, the, that was part of the reason that Jesus used that illustration so much was because people could relate to death becoming new life again, to mm -hmm. seeds being planted, to husks falling away. Um, so I think that this fear, um, around death is, um, I, I think that, you know, reading from the study guide that there has always been a certain curiosity around death and a need to determine what happens at death, because somehow, I mean, if you, if you listen to the witness of all the souls who've gone before us in the whole world throughout history, their witness is by these stories that they simply do not believe the soul ends at death. Right. That there is something in us that is linked to the eternal. And that seems to be like a known truth, generally speaking. Um, and so people have these different um, ways of understanding how that might work out. Mm, but my, I think the question I'm trying to get to here is, that in the book of Daniel, we begin to see for the first time threads of new understandings, new beliefs, synthesism of syncretism, even of other um, cultural beliefs, which, you know, we've kind of seen a little evidence of as we've gone along, but it's going to get more and more. It's going to increase as we go into the New Testament times. And so I want you to be aware um, that, that the Hebrew understanding of death up until they went into exile was pretty, pretty consistent. It was like Sheol. You know, they had a sense of, they had a sense of eternity. They had a sense of the soul knowing God, right? There, there was like this kind of paradoxical belief um, 
but this whole idea of there being this big resurrection at the end and everything that that happens and good and evil we be, this is the beginning of a wedge that enters into Judaism where we ultimately have the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees that plays out in the New Testament. And that difference is in large part around what they believe happens after death. And the other thing that I wanted to um, make sure that you realized was that you read the number three and the story of Ahura Mazda being opposed to the evil spirit Angra Mayinya and how, how much that story parallels what we believe from the Genesis through Jesus. Through mm -hmm. Jesus, folks. Mm -hmm. And this was back in Persian, in, during the Persian Empire that this stuff came about. BCE. And what I'm wanting you to begin to understand is that we don't have a lock on God. That God is going to reach the hearts of all the people in all the world. It is not on your shoulders. It is something that we are called to do in terms of what, who we are as a being within the context of who we are in our families and our communities. But we don't have to save people from hell. You know, that's just this, that whole concept. I'm trying to show you where that is coming in. Um, well, and so all of this is I kind of in preparation that. for our study of the New Testament, which is coming up because we're <laughs> just about to run out of Hebrew Bible. Gail, when I realized what you're saying right now about it's not our job to save people from hell, that was the most freeing thought or idea that I have ever had come into my life and and the the weight that was lifted off of my shoulders the day that became a realization in my head wow yeah well and and there's just i'm i'm trying to point out to you where the, even the idea of hell begins to enter the Hebrew understanding and culture, you know, that it wasn't always there. <laughs> that we as Christians talk about it like there's this, you know, fact, and this is the way it's always been. And it just, you know, we're almost to the end of the Hebrew Bible and we just haven't found that yet, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and, and I'm wanting you to be very grounded in who God is and what God wants. And if there's anything God wants, it is to dwell with all of us forever, all of us. And, and to that point, I have a question for everybody, theoretically. What if nothing happens when we die? What can we do about it? Nothing. What does it change about us? Nothing. <laughs> but this insane <laughs> desire we have to create this, this can't be the end of me. I have to go on forever. Uh, you know, I don't know. What if that's it? What if that's its own heresy that it's us trying to be immortal and that God is the immortal? I agree. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, I look at it from the other side of that pane of glass that even if it turns out that there is nothing after this life number one we won't know so it doesn't matter right. but number two in this life we are living in hope and we are living with an ethic that says work for peace work out of love help those who need help so everything that we are doing out of our faith 
is still enriching our lives. And then if we die and there's nothing there, well, people will remember us and that will kind of go back to a little bit to the early Hebrew idea that you lived on through your descendants. You know, we would live on through the memories of people who had known us and had fond thoughts of us, hopefully, um, but that it won't matter to us because we'll be gone. But this life is richer because we live with this hope, at least for me. Next generation. Yes. Leave it better mm -hmm. than the Girl Scout thing. Leave the campsite yeah. better than you found it. Yeah. That was always my mom's philosophy when we were moving out of a house. You know, you always have to leave it better than you found it. You know, <laughs> now, what it does make a difference of is whether you believe in God now. Yes. Because, because what ends up happening is do we believe there is an inherent good now? Do we believe there is inherent love now? Do we believe there is a reason for acting in love with that love, for acting heroically, for acting in a self-sacrificial manner? Um, and whatever you call that reason, um, that reason to is what I call God. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I and so um, I don't, for exactly, I think that that gives us, a, in a sense, a very healthy view of what our responsibility now actually is. As opposed to, oh, well, you know, people are either going to are going to choose God and then they're going to go to heaven and, and the rest of the world can go to hell in a handbasket. And the sooner the end time comes, the better. You know, I, don't, I think that's so irresponsible and so not godlike, you know. Um, yeah. But it also frees me to be able to have meaningful conversations with atheists, right? Because their sense of there is a reason to be good in this world still exists in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the outworking of God in their lives is still there, even if they don't name it or claim it, you know, yep. somebody, I saw somebody raise a hand, Julia. I, I had a question. This is off topic. It's back to your talk when, the angel was talking to Daniel and said, seal that scroll up, roll it up and seal it up. Who was the gutsy person that opened that scroll? <laughs> Very <we> true. <laughs> yes. Yes. And there is a sense, I think, that um, not that the scroll is cannot be read um, because typically in that day, um, if especially if they were contracts, um, it would they would either have a second copy that could be read or they would write on the outside what was on the inside so that the seal did not have to be broken. Um, and so there is a sense, I think here that there this will happen at an appointed time and at that point the seal is broken on that scroll. So is that, you know, jumping ahead, and I know we're not supposed to do this, but um, the, the mention of the- I've, I've of given the that to control you guys. <laughs> the, 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 the part in, in the book of Revelation where it talks about the seals, you know, the, the breaking of the seals on these things was more sort of almost like releasing the magic spell. Um, you know, once the seal is broken, this thing happens. This power and, enters into the world. Yeah, and so maybe that was- would it be that that was maybe part of this concept of take the scroll and seal it up because these things are not for this time? Yes. Um, That's what but, I think. So when the seal is broken on that scroll is when those things, when the time, appointed time has come for those things to happen, not necessarily for people to know about them. Yes. But, and also um, 
since you brought up Revelation, the, there is, <laughs> but this also, this concept we've already seen in earlier in Daniel, like when there were seals over the lion's den and seals on the various scrolls before that we've had before, is not only does the time, is the time appointed, but who is authorized to open that seal? Is it important? So it's very, very interesting. Y'all did a great job today. Turn this over in your heads. Um, think about, um, especially think about that third question and about the implications for what that means, uh, that that belief has been out there since Persian times. Um, and, and just be expanded. And I'll see you next week. Martha, did you have something? I'm looking at the chat. I'm oh, reading okay. what Thomas said. Yes. Thank you. I would like to share something with you, Gail, and with the rest of the group. The one thing that all this talk has really helped me for is have two of the most important conversations I'm having in my life. Um, all three of my kids were raised in the church, and two of them have decided that they aren't that anymore. And my youngest, um, it started, and I've shared this with Gail, in high school, a Muslim friend of hers died very unexpectedly. And she said, man, I tried, I tried, I've looked for the answer, I've tried to hold on to this, but I cannot recon reconcile that Van is in hell because she's Muslim, but I get to go to heaven because I'm Christian. And my son didn't have a specific tragedy bring this around, but he's really smart. And sadly, one of the things that I've learned about really smart people is that they struggle with religion because it's nothing tangible you can prove, like E equals MC squared. And so my son has kind of talked himself out of this. And it kind of comes down to, and I, I, this is my personal belief now after doing all this stuff, because I've really been thinking about this. I'm still struggling with that it's not my job to save others. I'm still a little bit, that's heresy because of Fisher's mm -hmm. thing. But that's just 58 years of ingrainment, right? But that John 3, 16, and that we focus all of our life on the saving end. And that maybe we have that backwards. And that's what I've told my kids. Maybe it's the now and the making things better for the next generation. That's my job to you, your job to your children, and to stop focusing on the end because we don't know. Yes. It's all and I, a solution. We don't. And it helps it very much to remember that the word saved also means being made whole and yes. complete. Yes. That is our mission here. And now, and the Jews call that tikkun olam. It's we are called to bring wholeness to the world. And my former pastor used to talk a lot about about bringing up there down here, that that bringing the kingdom to the here and now, here on earth, being being Jesus through our actions. To those around us not by going out and grabbing people by the collar at the beach or the mall or you know wherever they're doing it these days um but um but just being yes christ and jesus that was jesus whole message was the kingdom of heaven is now you enter life live it now yes mm -hmm. i used to uh, i used to go to the episcopal church and there was a hymn that we used to sing that had a phrase in it that said, I thought, that said, the kingdom of God is near. And one day we were singing that hymn and I realized that I had been mistaken all along that it said, the kingdom of God is here. <laughs> I burst Amen. into tears. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Gosh, I love you guys. I love you. It's time to stop. We can talk forever. Okay. See you next Bye. week. Bye. Bye. Bye.